Right, so we might as well start. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Kakos, and today I'm going to walk you through a personalization UX playbook. It's a one way, this is what my way of uh, how to handle or prepare for personalization on the web. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a digital ex experience lead at, at Morphed. Um, I work with lots of uh, human-centered design methodologies. Of course, what, what is a UX person without a, these methodologies? I've had more than 15 years. That's, I've had to cut down on those years because I don't look so old. Uh, working for a range of uh, national and international brands, both within uh, digital agencies, uh, whether the boutique is small or um, within a larger or glo global groups. This is, I'm going to show you my home. This is where I live. I live in that little uh, deserted island in the middle there where user experience sits. <laughs> I, I get lapped by the winds and tsunamis of requests coming from four corners of the earth. And that's the, uh, what the business imperatives are and what the business needs. Uh, and I've got to weigh them up against what the user on the opposite side wants um, and also work out how to deliver that within the right technology um, also while making sure that you're delivering something that is beautiful in the end. So uh, the technology as was well, feasible, um, business is what's viable, and the people is what's desirable. And then, of course, bring it all together, make it look all beautiful. Um, and that's the framework of everything I, I, I do and, and, and work so that I, I know how to deliver on, on the work successfully. Um, this presentation is for these types of people. So if you're not one of them, you know where the exit door is. <laughs> uh, no, everybody's welcome. So let's start with uh, personalization, what it means. So it's about tailoring the content of your site for visitors so that you can match some criteria such as their preference or the stage of the, their, their journey and their context. And we measure context or determine it by looking at some browser, a, a browsing history. Uh, the device they're on, the time of the day, the season, the location, and the tasks they're about to you know, carry out. There's more, of course, than, than that. Um, a simple type of personalization, and sorry if I'm doing a little plug for our, for our <laughs> website there, is something like this. You know, we know you've been here before, so we've personalized that to say, hey, we're now friends. Um, something that's a bit more complex than that. Uh, looks at uh, uh, this promo here because we know that you've read something on the weekly drop before getting to our website. Um, why do we need to worry about personalization? So I've got to give you some stats. This is based on uh, a survey conducted by McKinsey Group uh, looking at consumer behavior as it relates to personalization. Um, you'll see that uh, from that uh, survey that they've done, they found that 71% of uh, con uh, consumers expect personalization. Uh, 76 get frustrated if they don't get it. And we can all blame this on the, 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 the big digital um, companies out there, such as um, Amazon, who've been leading the way early on with, with personalization, with simple things as, here's something we recommend for you because of, we've seen you do uh, look at uh, certain things on, on our site. But not just Amazon, of course, all of the streaming services for entertainment like Netflix and so on. Um, and not to forget all of the social media platforms. So we live in a personalized world. And don't forget even friggin' TikTok, right? Um, there's all these <laughs> personalization algorithms that are pulling out information that you, you expected to see or would like to see. Um, so the, the consumer or the, the user is expecting personalization and it will, be, will get a bit frustrated without it. Uh, looking at a, a purchase intent, and this not, might not be uh, applied to uh, everybody in the room or the organization you work with, but at least it shows you that um, if someone engages, that, that 70 percent of, of consumers um, purchase, are more likely to purchase from a, a company if there is personalization on that side. 78% are more likely to repurchase or do a repeat purchase. Um, and then 78% are more likely to recommend that brand. So you can also look at this also from a, if, how, how you, if your site is not selling something, but if there's providing a service, that, that stuff also applies. Um, the whole thing is not the personalization. Not, it's not just a, a technical problem. You can 
buy a, a product off the shelf and off you go, it does it for you. It's really about solving a business problem and a marketing problem. Um, and when, you, when you've done that, uh, you, what you'll get to benefit from is uh, a, an engaged customer or engaged user. You start to have a two-way conversation with them. You nurture them, become a, a lead you know, in the commercial terms, uh, and then you convert them over to, to your cause. <laughs> Um, and you can retain them as a loyal customer. And, and that's when you develop some brand affinity with, uh, with, with your brand there, uh, and they're prepared to do some social sharing. So we saw that figure before of 78% are more likely to recommend. And what does all that boil down to? Higher revenue. Um, so where do we start? You ask a UX person, you get a UX answer, human-centered design. Right? <laughs> um, um, step one, I've given, I'm preparing a few steps here just to help you because this is essentially a playbook, right? Um, you identify your audience groups. If you haven't done that, you're in trouble already. Um, you segment them according to what experience they have, and what type of industry, and you can go crazy with all that segmentation. And then define each group's informational needs, their pain points, and their top tasks, and things like that. There's a few tools that I, that I use to help me with that process. One of them is this one. It's an empathy map. Um, I'm sure you've seen varieties of, of this map floating around the web, uh, but this is an example I found on game storming. Um, and one thing I know is when I've tried to use this map um, with uh, organizations that I service, uh, and, and allowing them to do it by some by themselves, they'll know you'll see the pain on their faces because they're trying to think uh, from the perspective of the of their user, their customer. What are they feeling? What are they thinking? What are their motivations? What do they hear from their um, peers um, about a certain problem? Um, and what do they see and say? And more importantly, we're, th we're having to focus on things like their motivations, their pains, their, their and their pain points. This is one way of doing it. There's also all sorts of other tools, but this starts the conversation. And if you find it really hard doing that on your own, come talk to me. I'll help you out. Um, then it, I think it's um, I find that it, it's really useful to apply this uh, marketing funnel um, approach. Also depends on the type of site that you're running, especially if you're trying to convert someone to uh, take on a service. Um, and this is a simplified marketing funnel where someone's aware of the brand or the service that you're, the, uh, that you're providing. Uh, so they're coming in at that top level of awareness. And that's what we call a prospect in terms of a, a commercial product. Uh, as the more they, inter you inter they interact with your site, this is the next stage of their journey. They become a lead because they're now evaluating uh, what you can do. They're no longer just passing by. And then as they spend more time with your brand, they might be converted to uh, adopting or taking on a service that you're providing, so they become a customer. Um, I've done this with um, a, a client of ours at the, the Department of Defense, where I've mapped out the journey in a completely entirely different way. So this is for um, um, the lovely people in the Army who prepare and train uh, <laughs> officers in, in war games. So their journey um, on, uh, in consuming information on the site that we've built is completely different. So I've used a customer journey mapping approach to map out all the tasks or the steps that go uh, to achieve the creation of a training package. So we mapped them out all together in a focus group setting, worked out what, what they're doing, but I took them through the empathy map first and to understand who they, th they are and what they need before getting to this here. And this is an important one because it's, it, it takes time and effort because you really want to analyze um, the, the things like what actions and tasks you're trying to achieve at that particular stage. And then what need you're trying to satisfy at that particular stage. And then what touch point, what tools or systems you need to interact with while you're seeking that information. And the pain points and frustrations you've, you're, you're, you face there. And it's always good to gauge their frustration. Uh, or their, their, you know, their sentiment. Am I happy to do this? Am I okay with it? Am I just neutral? Uh, because that also gives you another, uh, another nuance of how to interpret their frustration or uh, their motivation to get through these things. And you can always ask them about what opportun the, the opportunities. How can we fix this? If you have a frustration with this particular step, what do you think is the solution? 
Um, and that's been a very useful uh, tool for me to, to analyze all of that because then I can distill all the tasks they need to perform at each one of those stages. Um, next, what I do is, is define uh, some dimensions. This is the, the stage where you should be investigating uh, the tools, what personalization engine you, you, you can, you're prepared to use. Um, and now you're, you, you've defined some of the, the customer needs and, and the stages and the information about the customer. It will help you also select your personalization engine. So instead of going and buying some expensive thing off the shelf and then realizing I, all I want to do is some simple personalization, <laughs> do it the other way around. Find out how complex your personalization needs are and then work out what tool to use. Some of the dimensions we, we can program uh, around um, personalizations are things like, we talked about this before, geolocation, the, the time of day and season, the, what type of audience you are, and the type of topics that you're interested in, the stage or the step in your journey, and the goal you're trying to achieve. We can get a bit more complicated with uh, tracking or building towards your intent uh, by tracking some, uh, an, uh, a, a link that you've come through from an external bit of advertising or a newsletter and then show you uh, a bit of information uh, related to that on, on the site. So uh, step one, and this is step two, define your dimensions. And then you go defining your content. Well, I started like that, on a board with some scribbles. <laughs> um, it looks better like this. Uh, and also, this is a simplified version. So if I can try to build this out compared to the journey map that I did for the Department of Defense, it will be a lot bigger than this. So it, this is only a recommended uh, way of doing it, of course. So you work out your stage. We talked about the marketing funnel of awareness, evaluation, and conversion, and work out the tasks that, we, that, that we've identified through the journey mapping and also the empathy map, what those tasks are for each stage. Uh, and you can see there's A1s and E1s and C1s, um, and also what what goal you're supporting uh, at, at that stage so that you can push that user forward. And also you can deliver some relevant uh, um, material to, as way of extra supporting information uh, along the way. I will show you what all this means in a second. Now that's that important step what every uh, UX designer wants to do is just design a page and put some stuff on it and get some content in. Um, I will show you, uh, so the, the help thing is, I know this a screenshot is showing you just some um, uh, homepage, but it's, we've got to think about it, of course, outside of just the homepage, because a lot of personalization um, presentations I've been to and things I've read show you all these examples of, here's the homepage and this is how we personalize it. And the previous examples on the Morph website were just on the home page. But no, work out the priority pages your customer lands on most. And then start there. Um, because that's the, the where, where they see you. Maybe they've come in through uh, SEO or some uh, other, other means and found that, that particular page that they're most interested in. Um, and then you go and define the content placement and the, uh, the role that each uh, piece of content plays on, on that. So I'm going to show you just a close-up uh, what that looks like. Uh, here it is. So I mock this up real quick. So maybe you would start the with a hero space if you're uh, personalizing the homepage with uh, the stay a stage message, something that says that we know you've been here before, or we know that you're a loyal customer. You've been multiple times, and they're all about some rules that we can build into the system to understand based on your browser uh, history and how many times you visited uh, that you are either a uh, first time visitor or a loyal customer and so on. And we can promote a, a message at the top there just to recognize, to, to tell the person that we know something about you and we're tailoring this message to you. Now we don't have to get creepy about it, so that's the <laughs> the, the other thing. Um, and as we saw before in that table with uh, and the the customer journey mapping, we're plotting out some tasks, uh, and they are that we the uh, an approximation of all the tasks that we have you know collected and known that a, a customer might want to perform uh, within that particular stage they're in whether they're in awareness or they're evaluating or they're about to convert. Um, and this is where that goal promotion uh, box could sit. 
so that if they see and uh, have that these are some of the tasks they've done, this might be the next natural progression for them to, uh, and that's why I place the call to action button. So do this thing next um, to help them along the, the, the journey. And the supporting information, and these, this could be something like uh, a, a blog post or a, or a news article that is relevant to them, or maybe even a podcast uh, that helps them you know, uh, understand the things that they're preparing for. So if you are, for instance, trying to sign someone up to become a member for a service that you're doing, this will be ideal as, um, supporting information as to what you could do as a member, uh, to put it there. But um, some of the tasks are to look at your eligibility for to, to become a member, um, what happens after you sign up, and that sort of stuff before you do the, that gold promo to sign up here, to, because you're now ready to become a member. Is this sounding all right? Uh, next step is to analyze. So this is a, a dashboard that we did in, in Google uh, Data Studio. To, uh, it's a, one of those experiments that we've done. Um, and this is showing you, uh, we're calculating things like, um, and, and tracking things, uh, the different topics that get used most uh, across the site, because we're now tracking all that information. Uh, which audiences are interacting most with your content in that time frame that we're looking at? What stage uh, are, are those uh, users uh, are in, in so that you know what is the most important stage and, and how many of your customers are in which stage the, in their journey? Um, there are other, way, other things that we can pull out there, but I'm just giving you an idea. And it's always important to track these because it's really a learning experience. Uh, so that you know that all of that work that you've done in preparing all that personalization, is it working or not? So what do we do after <laughs> analyzing? We always have to adopt a experimental uh, mindset and go back to, after you analyze, go back and check what you've done in discovery to make sure are the tasks correct? Have I misinterpreted things? And go back into defining more dimensions if you wanted to and then defining the content that sets that up. And number four, you design and build your pages uh, again, and then you go back into analyzing. And keep going through that tumbling circle until you get it right. Um, of course, don't go crazy and, and build that for five different audience groups. Start with one. <laughs> uh, start with a priority one that's going to get you the best results, um, that will alleviate some pain. Imagine if a particular type of customer is the, is the one that hits up the, the call center most and is generating all these support requests all the time. Start with that and then work your way down the list and, and see how that improves that, that experience. Um, and then where does that all fit in then now that you've, that you've done that? Who owns uh, the, the personalization experience? Um, and that's why we're putting up content ops. We've all heard of DevOps and, and design ops. Um, but then there's now there's a, a trending term there for, for content ops as people who uh, manage the, the content process and tools and systems. So you've got to work out who owns personalization. You can't expect everybody to own it. Um, how do you embed it into the, the current systems and processes in, uh, the, of your content development in, the, uh, in your organization? Um, and what's the impact on the on that content lifecycle? Who's gonna because the content ops department or the, the person that owns it needs to um, manage that lifecycle of that content to keep it fresh and and relevant. And uh, most importantly, what tools do you use to manage that content? Um, famous people, famous quotes. Um, well, he didn't quite say that himself. I'm going to take it off before I get sued for fraud. Or <laughs> uh, here's some other interesting quotes as to why personalization is good. Right, questions. I know I breezed through this really quickly, but <laughs> and I've covered lots of ground, so I'm open for lots of questions. Yeah. Yep. The the uh, launch Convivial app, uh, Convivial module. Mm. That's that's a personalization. Is that how that? 
the most convivial module. Yeah. yeah, is that a personalization? Yeah. Now we've we've got a a, a, a separate uh, capability for personalization. It's called Personified. Uh, it, it's a separate product that we've built that helps uh, track the user's information and context and, and preferences and be able to capture that uh, in, in local storage. So it's anonym an anonymous personalization. So we're not getting going into the creepy area of we know what type of socks you wear and that sort of stuff. Another question there. It's important that people, you know, like I think just The question, the question is, uh, is it when you personalize content on the site, is it important to tell people that it's personalized? Um, look, based on our experience with, with how you uh, interact with social media and Amazon and so on, it doesn't tell you other than, you know, recommend it for you or you might like this um, in, a, in, a, in a gentle way because otherwise, um, I was thinking about that actually this morning, is whether it's important to, um, to, to phrase something, you're seeing this because <coughs> you like so-and-so. And there are sites that, that, that do this. Um, but there are also, there's also, I think, there's some resistance for, from people who feel like privacy is being invaded. Uh, that yeah, that they that it it creeps them out. So I think my approach would be to keep it a subliminal, gentle, because especially the the approach we're taking is that it's all anonymous anyway, and we're presenting information that's going to grab your attention because you're gravitating towards that that content. So maybe you know language like you may like this or uh, <laughs> this, this is this is of interest to you. Yeah, is is gentle enough to push them along the way. And as part of that experimentation also is if you, if you have a, a panel of customers you can always tap into and, uh, and invest and, uh, an interview after you release some of that stuff to see how they take on your personalization effort, work out if they like it, that approach or not. Because you can't just give um, advice that, that could work across all sorts of industries for all types of audiences. So uh, experimenting, trying that out would be best and having that access to getting feedback directly from the client from the user would be best. <laughs>